No. No. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come along and talk to you about fire. Uh, in fact, as you will see from the slide, um, it's, uh, it's taken me a bit of a journey to get here. Uh, I came over first in 2018, when unfortunately, of course, there were the, the riots. We tried again in 2019, uh, but COVID got in the way. And so this time uh, is, the, is the third time, third time lucky, and I get the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, the topic for today is what is fire and why is it important for clinicians? The things that a clinician should know about fire. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I am a medical doctor, although I haven't practiced medicine for many years now. Uh, I'm a developer. I develop the ClinFire application that we'll be talking about in the next session. I'm HL7 fellow, geomeritus. So I've been around HL7 and fire pretty much from the beginning. And I do uh, a number of work uh, on fire related projects in uh, New Zealand and elsewhere. And I also blog quite, uh, quite a lot or used to. About you. So unfortunately, uh, I can't be there in person, but I assume that you have a clinical or a business informatics background uh, and you understand the need to share clinical data, uh, both about a patient between providers and also more importantly, with the patient uh, as they are participating more in their health care. I assume that you have an interest in the underlying technology. You want to know how it works. And ideally, what you're aiming to do is to be able to participate knowledgeably in integration projects that contain fire. This is the agenda for my talk. I'm going to start out with a quick background to fire, where it came from, some of the benefits to various parties. Then we'll dive into some of the details. Again, it'll be at a fairly high level because fire is a, is a large standard, but we'll talk about the important parts, the, the resources, data types, how to exchange data, references between the resources and so forth. And I would like it that at the end of this talk, you have a good idea as to where you can go to get more information about fire and how to engage further with the community. Uh, as I said, there is another session coming up and in that session uh, will be pretty much full on demonstration of the ClinFire tool, which uh, I'm responsible for. Uh, and it's a learning tool, which I hope you will find useful. So a little bit about fire history. So fire started about seven years ago and it started because HL7 International realized that with the uh, new technologies such as mobile devices uh, uh, and the internet, uh, as these were becoming more widespread, existing standards, existing HL7 standards weren't really fit for purpose. And so they had a project they called the Fresh Look. And it said, if we were starting out an interoperability standard today, what would it look like? And they got a very clever chap called Graham Greve from Australia to lead up that project. And it went on from there. And what happened was it was a question of right place, right time. So at around about the time that that was getting going, a report came out in the United States called the Jason Report, and it called out the lack of a real-time API for health data. And of course, FHIR at that time in particular was about a real-time API, and it really took off since then. And then since then, we've had pretty much universal uptake by vendors, a massive interest in the providers of healthcare, worldwide implementations, um, a very large global community, uh, and the scope itself has increased beyond simple interoperability to, to more things such as storage of data uh, and analytics. Um, so that's where FHIR has come from. What is FHIR? Well, FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources and refers to the fact that it should be rapid, it should be fast to be able to both develop the standard, but also to implement it. So for people who are actually doing interoperability projects, FHIR should be pretty straightforward to learn and understand, mainly and, and a lot because it uses technologies that are already widely used elsewhere. An H07 interoperability standard. So as I've said before, uh, it, um, it's about a sharing of clinical information. I like to say that there are two main parts to the, to the FHIR core. The first is the content model or the information that we want to exchange. And the second is the actual specification. How do you change that data? 
how to exchange that data. In this presentation, we'll be focusing mostly on the content model. But FIRE has grown a lot since then. In particular, it's extended into the areas of clinical knowledge, of decision support, of persistence, actually saving data. Of course, a key part is that you do not have to save information in FIRE resources to share it. Very, very deliberately, it was designed to be able to be used by existing systems who store data in their own way. Uh, bulk data, there are additional specifications that have grown up around, around FIRE, the use of things like SMART, CDS hooks, and so forth. Again, we won't have time to talk about those in this presentation, but you will come across them in your FIRE journey. And finally, and in some ways most importantly, FIRE is supported by a very large, very international, very enthusiastic community. Uh, I put a couple of links down on the bottom right-hand side there. The first is to the specification itself which is very uh, understandable for a health specification, but also to the FIRE chat, where you can go to get help uh, about FIRE. Um, we absolutely encourage people to participate, uh, whatever your skill uh, level is. Um, it's a very friendly site, and it's not impossible to get answers to questions in minutes. So I would certainly urge you, if you are moving forward with FIRE, to check out the FIRE chat. The benefits of FIRE. Why, why should you think about getting involved in FIRE? So I like to break this down into four main types of user. So for a clinician, such as many of yourselves, it lowers the bar to being able to understand and to become involved in a health interoperability standards. With previous standards such as version 2 or CDA, or version 3, there's quite a technical bar. You, you need to know a lot in order to understand what's going on. That's not the case, we believe, with FIRE. And of course, another benefit to a clinician is that by making it easier to share data, we're enabling fast, more timely access to higher quality healthcare data. From the perspective of a consumer or a patient, well, it's making it easier for them to access their own data uh, because what it's done is to help build up an ecosystem whereby applications can far more easily access the information that is being held in repositories. So what that means for a patient is that not only can they see what their information is, it makes it easier for them to become involved in healthcare um, and to participate in healthcare as an, as an active participant rather than just a recipient. From the perspective of a healthcare organisation, such as a hospital, it gives the ability to innovate. So by having fire interfaces on top of their existing electronic health records, it means that they can create specific applications for specific purposes, which nevertheless integrate with their core information systems. And this brings flexibility in the way that they deliver care and support their providers of care. And finally, from the perspective of a vendor, FIRE uses very familiar technologies and development environments. You don't need to learn new ways of doing things uh, in order to participate in FIRE or to use uh, create FIRE interfaces. Instead, you use the technologies you're familiar with and uh, they can then be um, uh, directly used in creating FIRE type interfaces. This leads to rapid development, lower development costs, and more importantly, this concept of the app marketplace. And interestingly, that is where uh, the SMART standard has come about uh, because it facil facilitates the development of mini applications, if you like, which can securely interact with backend systems. So again, SMART is something to definitely become familiar with. Here are some sample use cases. Uh, I won't go into these in any kind of detail, but they just call out the kind of areas where you might use a fire-based application um, for sharing data. So there's a direct exchange of data, real-time access, referrals, that's quite a common one. Storage, people are actually starting to use fire resources as the way of storing data in an EHR. As I said before, it's absolutely not a requirement of using fire, but people have found, and particularly startups, have found that it actually works quite well um, and they then don't have the conversion issue between some other representation and fire resources. So you'll see that quite a lot. And there are now fire servers, that they're a free service that you can get, but there are commercial uh, servers as well, 
which means you can get started with applications very quickly. And then things like clinical decision support, analytics, bulk data, again, are other areas that we're seeing fire being used. Right, resources, what are they? So the resource, which is the R in fire, is the content model. It is the thing which is being exchanged. It's important to appreciate that it's informed by a lot of past work, both inside and outside of HL7. Organizations such as OpenEHR, SME, ISO 136, ISO 13606, and so forth, um, are all involved in helping to design the, the fire resources. Each resource has got a, uh, a committee inside of HL7, which is responsible for its content, and that committee coordinates input from the wider community into the resources themselves. And there's a key point here as well, is that fire resources are very definitely deliberately minimal. When you look at a resource in the specification, you will almost certainly say it's missing this. Um, and that's deliberate. We wanted to keep the resource as small and easy to use as possible, but also to make it straightforward to extend them and enhance them for your own needs. And that's what profiling is, and we'll be touching on that in a little while. Here are some examples of fire resources. There are around about 130 or so at the moment, um, but you'll see that each resource has got a name. So for example, like a patient reflects a patient data, practitioner is about a deliverer of healthcare. Interestingly, a practitioner does not have to be a qualified practitioner. We're not saying they're a doctor or a nurse. We're just saying that they are somebody who delivers care to a patient. And you'll see all of this in the specification. And there's two things I like to call out at about this point. The first is that because each resource has a name which describes what it does, that means it's straightforward to uh, understand what a resource is doing. So for example, patient is, as we've said, patient. In HL7 version two, that's the PID segment inside of a message. Now, it's in order to know that it was a PID segment, you had to understand what version two was all about. And fire's not like that. The barrier to entry is much lower. And conversely, if you're wanting to represent some bit of information, it's much easier to find the, um, the resource which is appropriate. So if I am wanting to represent an allergy, for example, there's a resource called allergy intolerance, and I'm good to go. The link down the bottom right hand corner takes you straight to the list of all resources inside of FHIR. Uh, and so I would encourage you to go and take a look at those. They, uh, again, are easy to read and fully hyperlinked to be, enable you to go into further detail. You will actually see numbers alongside each resource. And this is, we, we have a concept we call the maturity model. And it's based on the CMM maturity model, if you're familiar with that. And what it does is it indicates how widely a particular resource type has been used out there. And so therefore, you know, how, how good a fit it is to your need and what's the likelihood of, of it actually changing over time. So you'll see it's a number between one, uh, one through five and then N for normative. And it just, the higher the number, the more a resource has been used. Again, we absolutely encourage implementers and others to give us feedback onto the uh, resources so that we know that we've got it right. There's an important point here. The word resource is, is used in a lot of different places. And there's a key difference between the, the resource type and the resource instance. So a resource type is its definition in the specification. A resource instance is a filled out type. And I liken this to a cookie cutter. So the type is the template which cuts out the cookies. The instance is a cookie. It's something which has real data in it. So if we take our patient, for example, then the patient type that you see in the specification is what you could potentially record for a patient. Whereas an actual patient record for John Doe, age 25 or whatever, is an instance of the patient type. So when, when you're talking about resources, just mentally say to yourself, is it a type or is it an instance? Here is an example of an instance on the wire. Uh, this is using uh, what we call JSON format, which is very, very common uh, in the web world. And this kind of shows the four main parts that you see in a, in a resource instance. 
At the top in green there, we have the identity and the metadata about the resource. Next up, we have a human readable summary. Uh, we call this the lesson of CDA. So every resource has got the ability to have a textual description of what it actually is. Uh, and the rule is that it's optional, but it should be safe to show it to a human and they will understand what the resource is about. Next up is the extension. And this is where we have the ability to add uh, new elements into a resource that aren't in core, uh, and I'll talk about that shortly. And then finally down the bottom in blue are the structured data, and this is specific to a resource type. So in the resource type and the specification indicates what these structured data elements are, and the name um, is set, it won't change, which means it's, it's quite straightforward to understand what's inside a resource. So the structured data, of course, is for computers to do things with. This is a really key concept. This is the concept of references between resources. So a single resource in and of itself isn't actually tremendously helpful. I mean, if it's just a patient or just a condition, it's when you link them together that you have the ability to start to tell a clinical or administrative story. And the example that I've got here is that of a procedure. So the procedure, which is in the middle resource in the middle there, maybe it's an appendectomy. Um, the procedure was done on somebody. So the subject of the procedure was a patient resource up to the top there. And then down the bottom right hand corner is the performer. So who actually carried out the appendectomy? Who assisted in the operation? Um, we have the encounter and, and so on and so forth. So the message here is to show how uh, a key concept is to take the individual resources, join them together in what we sometimes call a graph of resources to tell your clinical story. Let's take an example. Uh -huh. Okay, so, sorry, I up too far. So here we have an example of recording a consultation. So this is the example of a, uh, I'm not quite sure what you, you call it in, in your country, we call it a general practice uh, encounter. Americans call it ambulatory care, but this is a, 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 young, a young boy uh, visiting a, a doctor with pain in the ear. And pain in the ear for three days, he had an elevated temperature. On examination, the temperature was 38 degrees. Uh, diagnosis of otitis media was made and uh, amoxa, amoxicillin was prescribed. And then he came back a couple of days later with an itchy skin rash, um, no breathing difficulties on examination, uh, um, an urticarial rash and a diagnosis of allergy was made and the antibiotics changed. So what I've done in this picture is to color code each sort of item, if you like, in the, um, in the clinical story with the particular resources that could be used to represent that, that particular part. So the orange 12-year-old uh, boy is a patient resource. Of course, for the consultation, we need to have an encounter and so forth. And so you can see how you know, different resources link together to tell the story. So let's dig into it just a little bit deeper. So here we have one of those graphs I was talking about. So like the example with the procedure before, here we show uh, graphically the individual resources and how they are linked together in order to represent the story that we've just seen. This is actually just for the first consultation. And interestingly enough, uh, this graph was created by Graph Builder, which is the tool I'm going to talk about in the next session. But here we see very clearly the patient in green at the middle, uh, the encounter over there, and we see that the subject of the encounter is the patient. And then down to the lower right hand corner there, we have the practitioner, Marcus Welby, uh, and Marcus Welby. Um, was a participant in the encounter. Down the bottom there, we have the condition, otitis media, that's the diagnosis. And we can see that that condition was asserted by Marcus Welby. So he's the one who said this was otitis media. John Doe was the subject, he's the one who's got it. And the context was in the middle of the, uh, of the encounter. So what I think, or what I would like to um, uh, say is that this shows how uh, you can get this very granular information and you can understand how you can both sort of share this quite easily because people, everything's linked together in ways they understand, but because it's so granular, you can start to do analyses should you want to. You know, you could answer questions, 
what's the most common medication used for otitis media by analyzing this, this, this data. So this is a good example of capturing data in a structured and coded way for both the delivery of healthcare, but also for analytics as well and, and, uh, and reporting. Structured data. So I've talked about the word structured data. Um, I, I'd just like to, to call out the difference between textual data, structured data, and coded data. So textual data is just um, text, you know, like a Word document or a PDF document. It's useful for a person to look at, for a clinician or for a patient, but it's not much good for an actual computer who wants to record the data. Structured data is where you take a something and you have identifiable parts of it. And the example you can see from the picture there, which is a patient, is we see that a patient has got an identifier, which might be a medical records number. They have a name. They have a telecom, telephone information, they have a gender, they have a birth date, and so forth. So these are individual slots, we call them elements, fire elements. Um, and so that makes it very explicit for a computer to be able to go in and pull out the data which they might need to store. Coded data that we'll talk about shortly takes that one step further and lets us uh, link into things like SNOMED and ICD. We'll talk about that one in just a second. And the big value of having structured data is that it greatly improves the quality of exchange. It allows data extraction. And you saw that hopefully in the example that we've just had, if we wanted to do things like, you know, pulling out um, uh, uh, patients um, who have been given a particular medication. And it drives that secondary use. It drives the ability to provide decision support, analytics, population health, and other reporting directly from the uh, data which is being captured by a GP uh, or uh, a practitioner. Uh, and again, it's really important if you're wanting to do this, this more advanced stuff, you don't want to give extra work to your practitioners. What you want to be able to do is to uh, pull out the data you need for the information that they would be collecting anyway. Uh, and you can see a link down the bottom there. That's the link to uh, the specification where this is a, um, an extraction from. Coded data. So coded data is the is the next step in improving the quality of, of healthcare. And it's moving to what we call semantic interoperability, where the meaning of the exchange is, is, is absolutely explicit. These are some of the core parts of um, how FHIR represents coded information. And it, 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 it calls out the important parts. So we actually have over on the left-hand side there, a code system. So that's something like SNOMED or ICD, um, or I ICPC or whatever it is, that's where your codes are defined. Then you have a resource we call the value set. And the value set is a selector. So the value set states that in, the, in this particular context, so I'm talking about the patient marital status, here is a set of codes that you should actually use. And then we have the concept called binding from the definition of the element. So the element uh, patient uh, marital status is bound to a particular value set, which in turn is the selector for a particular set of concepts. And then in the actual instance, remember the cookie, then in the instance, the, um, the instance will point directly to the code system. So this kind of relationship is actually quite important and it's, it's well worth spending a bit of time to understand and get right. So if we come back to, um, to the example I was talking about, marital status, uh, we see down here that in the instance of marital status, um, it's pointing directly to the code system. And that's what that system is doing. So that system is saying uh, uh, U stands for unmarried. And hence, we get this semantic interoperability. It's not pointing to the value set. And that's the key part. Although we talk about value sets a lot, um, because they are the binding between our, our uh, base type or our profile. Remember, the value set is just a selector. It's not the actual definition. So again, that's the key point to take away here. And so talking just a little bit more about the value set, uh, a, a context specific subset of one or more concepts from one or more code systems. Again, that's an important point. A value set can call or can, uh, can, uh, can describe, contain um, 
values from different code systems. It could, for example, have some codes from SNOMED and some from ICD. It's actually more common that it has something like a number from um, SNOMED and then some self-defined ones. Here's an example of a value set over on the right hand side there. This is for the status of, um, of a condition. And you can see that we've got provisional, differential, confirmed. So the value set um, contains those ones. The definition of them is in the, is in the code system. So all code systems have a binding to a value set. It's a key part in profiling, as we'll talk about it just before. And there are a number of services which help support that. Profiling. So I've talked about profiling a couple of times. Um, the, the reason for profiling is because we have a number of different, if you like, contexts in healthcare, places where healthcare settings is another way, but we only want one set of resources. For example, if we are recording a blood pressure in the general practice ambulatory care scenario, we might just be um, recording the systolic and the diastolic. But if we're recording it in an ICU, then we may want to know the patient's position, the cuff size, um, whether they're on other medications that might affect blood pressure, and so on and so forth. So the, we have a single observation, have a single resource, it's observation in this case, which we can adapt to those different settings. And fundamentally, that's what profiling is all about. Describing the usage of fire based on its context. And then more importantly, allowing these sorts of, these sort of how you use something, the use of statements to be authored in a structured way so that machines can look at them, computers can understand them, to be able to be published and to be able to use as the basis for, for validation reports and even the generation of a user interface. So fundamentally what profiling does is profiling adapts FHIR for specific scenarios. And in fact, FHIR you can think of as being a platform specification. It's, it's the base upon which profiles and implementation guides, that's what IG stands for, um, are, are created. So in real life, it is very, very common, in fact, to, to, to have profiled resources, to have extensions. It's almost uncommon not to. And I talked before about the desire to keep the resources nice and simple. And we expressed this in the 80% rule. So we said that a, a particular element only goes into a resource if 80% of systems are already using it. We very, very deliberately wanted to make sure that fire was easy to use. It represented what people were already doing in healthcare, not what we, the standards developers, think they ought to be doing, because that latter approach really doesn't work very well. And so you'll see in the base, there's very few fields that are actually required. You can have a patient with no name, no date of birth, no gender, um, minimal bindings that can't be altered. And it's the profiling which then takes that base and says, in our particular usage, the name is required. So here's that example down through there. We have the base specification, we have profiling, and then we come out of the other end with a customized implementation guide. So profiling a single resource, how do we take that resource? We do three main things to it. The first thing we do is we constrain it. We remove elements that we don't need, we change multiplicity. Um, the second thing we do is we change element binding, coded element binding. So we say that um, in our particular domain, these are the uh, marital status codes that we understand. They're not the same as one, same ones as in the specification. And the third thing we commonly do is we add a new element. So patient, for example, does not have gender or race uh, or ethnicity or religion. So those are all things that you can add by using an extension. And I'll just very quickly men mention the concept of modifier extensions. In most cases, an extension adds something. If you don't understand what it is, it doesn't really matter because if you don't understand what it is, chances are you can't do anything with it. But there's also the ability to have modifier extensions which change the meaning. You might have an extension which says that a medication was not given. And in that case, it's not safe to ignore the extension. We call those modifier extensions. Each profile has got a unique URL. We call this the canonical URL. Uh, that's kind of like a web page. You know, you type a web page into a browser. 
And the whole point is to make this globally unique so that uh, if you uh, receive a, a resource and it has an extension, you can absolutely go away and find out what that extension means. And then we package multiple profiles together as implementation guides along with other artifacts as well. And it's the implementation guide which um, then um, says, you know, here is the, here is the scenario, uh, maybe it's a referral, um, and here are the resources that you need for a referral, and here are the changes that we've made, and examples down the bottom there, US Core, Argonaut, and so forth. And so if we take our patient example, um, we might want to say that the identifier uses a national identifier. You, you must use the NHI in New Zealand, and it's required, it must be there. You might want to say that we can only have one name, and you must have one name. You might want to change marital status to a different set of possible values because um, the uh, sets, the values in Chile are different to the ones in, um, in the main spec. We don't support a photo and we want to add an extension. So those are common things that we do when we are profiling an extension. So just to, to hammer that point home, I think I've talked about most of these things already, so I, I won't go over it. It's here for reference. Um, extensions are normal and the instance, so remember the patient instance, the cookie, when it has an extension, it will always have the URL of the extension definition. So that means you can always, you always have the ability to find out uh, what the extension actually means if you need to do so. Implementation guide, I've touched on that. The implementation guide is how we package these things up for a particular scenario. We see the example there is um, uh, the Argonaut data query that can be under H or seven, or it can be a country, or it could even just be a particular application saying, here's how I use fire. I do want to touch on a, an allied standard called uh, Fire Shorthand, which is pretty new. Um, it's really only been going about a year. It's what we call a domain specific language. So what it is, it, it grew out of the, the fact that creating profiles is not that easy to do technically. It's quite complicated under the hood. And there is tooling that's available, but it wasn't that straightforward to use. So Shorthand came along as being a quicker way to do that. It also brought in the quicker way to be actual to to be actually create instances to create examples of um, of what uh, of what resources could be. So uh, I think it's very very important. It's straightforward, relatively straightforward to understand. But I think if, if a clinician or a BA is getting involved in fire, it's worth learning fire shorthand. Um, here's an example. I'll move fairly quickly. So let's say. I'm wanting to profile an organization and I don't want to include the address or the contact. I need an, another element. I'll leave this here for you to look through. But here's what the fire shorthand would look like. And you can see up there, line two says I'm profiling an organization. Lines 10 and 11 says, you know, I don't have the address or the contact. Lines 18 through 26 are bringing in the, um, the uh, organization ID and so forth. And I can even, in shorthand, describe what the extension is. So here's an extension being the period over which a uh, organization is active. And I'm saying that this is a, a period data type. I can also use it for examples. Here is an example of uh, line five tells me that it's an allergy intolerance. It's actually uh, an allergy intolerance. Uh, it's compliant to a profile on allergy intolerance. We can see the description there. We see the text. Lines 12 and 13 give us the coding or clinical status coding and so forth. So I think that this is fairly straightforward for, uh, for somebody to understand. And it's, it's a, a very easy way of, um, of being able to see what's inside a resource. But I, I do emphasize it is a design time tool. It is not how the information is actually exchanged. That's in the XML or JSON resources but it is a way in which you can create them. All of this is bringing us to the concept of the ecosystem. So the idea that we have a number of services out there in the world, things like the conformance registry, terminology, provider registries, repositories, and so on and so forth. And then down the bottom there, we have applications. And these might be mobile applications, desktop applications, device-specific applications. But they can all access that data 
through Fire API and resources. And of course, there's a security layer that's in there, that's smart or some other kind of one to, you know, to make sure that security and privacy is taken care of. And then off to the side there, we have the reporting. So by using Fire as our main interface, we are increasing and enhancing the possibility of creating a, uh, a whole ecosystem of healthcare data to the benefit of both the deliver, deliverer of the, uh, of the healthcare and also, in fact, most importantly, the recipient, the patient themselves. And we, we are seeing this ecosystem uh, start to develop in a number of different countries. So finally, um, uh, just a bit of a reality check. Um, and I put the slide in after a talk I gave a number of years ago when somebody came up to me afterwards and said, uh, or a couple of days later and said, well, look, you know, you gave this talk and it was really great and it sounded so easy. And I went to my IT department and they said, no, hold on a second, there's a few things to think about. So a lot of this is, is about managing expectations. And at the, at, the, at the time I was building a house. And so the analogy I had was that fire is kind of like the concept plan. You know, it's where you, you note down everything that you want, but there's still a lot of work behind to go from that concept into a real interface. You know, when we're exposing healthcare data, we've got to make sure it's safe, we've got to make sure it's accurate, we've got to make sure it's secure, and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, what does FIRE really stand for? And it stands for far harder in real life. I just made that up. It's not official, so please don't quote me. But the important point I want to say here is that FIRE is a wonderful, wonderful step towards being able to safely expose healthcare data, but it's a complex thing to do. Here is a, a slide with uh, a number of places you can go to to get further information, both from H or 7 itself, uh, but also hosted by the community, number of blogs. Over on the right hand side there is some of the uh, tooling, which is freely available. So Java libraries are, are free to use, download and use. Most people actually use a library of some sort. Um, there's test servers. Uh, you can actually download a test server for free and use it uh, to develop a, a system. You can even use it to host a system. But there are also you know, commercially available variants of those servers. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm quite happy to take any questions if uh, we have time to do so. Thank you very much, David Hay, for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, when one, one of the big topic is security or safety. No, as we know in fire, in, it's not worry about this topic because the, the 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 focus is in interoperability. But do you know if Fire will take this topic in the future, or is not the the scope? So Fire very deliberately say, states that it's not a security standard, and the reason for that, of course, as you've said, is the focus is on interoperability, but also because. Security is something which is done differently in different places, um, and it's a highly, highly specialized area. But what FIRE does do is it provides hooks uh, into secure systems. So, for example, there are a number of resources that you can use, like the audit event resource, uh, the provenance resource, uh, to help enable secure systems. And there's actually a whole page in the FIRE specification that talks about the sorts of things that you need to think about to um, create a secure system. And we highly advise people to go in and take a look at that. And it, it talks about the need to use a secure channel such as SSH, uh, to use authentication, um, to be able to record the provenance of data and, and so on and so forth. So the way to think about it is that uh, FIRE sort of enables and interacts those secure systems, but it lets you decide what's the best way, what suits your system. Just imagine if FIRE said, this is how you do security, uh, you must use OAuth 2. And somebody didn't use OAuth 2, you know, they used a different security standard, FIRE wouldn't work for them. So uh, we, we keep ourselves at the level of saying what you need to do to be secure, um, but we, we let the specialists decide how to actually implement it. Okay, thank you very much. 
for your answer. Uh, well, uh, again, thank you again for your presentation. I would ask you if you have a, a final message uh, in order to to encourage the interoperability, uh, of course, in your country, but of course, in, in Chile or Latin America. Uh, so if you have a few words in order to, to close this presentation. Yep. I think the thing is that fire uh, is like democratizing information, healthcare information, if I, can, if I can use that. I think fire makes it straight, more straightforward for people who aren't specialists and who are more business experts, such as clinicians or informaticians, to get involved in fire projects. It, it, it makes it more, far more easy to understand what's going on. You don't have to create a series of requirements and give it to the technical people to do. You can be part of it all the way down. And uh, the, the other big thing, the really, really big thing is that fire is technology, but most importantly, it's that community. We emphasize this over and over and over again. Um, fire is a community of people. It, it's exemplified in the fire chat, uh, and I had a link to it earlier on in the presentation. And again, I'd absolutely encourage people to get involved in that chat. It's just wonderful the way that you can ask a question and get an answer so quickly. And people are, are willing to share their knowledge and their experience to others who need it. So uh, that would be my message. Get involved in the community. OK. <clears throat> Uh, well, thank you very much again for your question and answers. Uh, all of this war in fire, I know is the good thing is not only for uh, the implementers or ven vendors, also for the clinicians to get involved in this. Uh, so I really appreciate. So goodbye. That's my pleasure. And I'm, I'm really, really glad that we were able to uh, finally get to the point that we can uh, we can deliver it. And I, I wish you every success in your conference and also in your, your implementation of, uh, of FIRE moving forward. And I look forward to seeing you and your people actively participating in the community. Okay. Well, so, uh... Yeah, we, we, we have the final question, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain the stressness types for the binding encoding elements against code system? I think this is the, the last question we can answer. Uh, so, oh, the strength, did you say? The yeah. strength of binding? Yeah, OK. So the um, it's a very good question. Um, and I might just very quickly go back Oops, what's happening? If I can, oops. So when we were talking about, gosh, there we go, here we go. So there was the binding there. So the the, the binding, as I said, states for this element and this and this usage. Here is the set of here's the set of possible values. And, and I said that sometimes you want to be able to change that set for a particular, uh, particular use. But in some cases, we don't want you to. So in some cases, for maximum interoperability, we want you to use our set and our set only. You often see that in things like status. So the status of an observation, it might be preliminary, it might be final, it might be amended. It's actually really, really important that everybody uses the same codes. Otherwise, you'll get something, you know, you won't understand what something means. So the binding strength of something is a way of being able to say, are you allowed to change this? It's there, there are a few what we call required bindings. A required binding cannot be changed. Uh, you must use one from the official value set. As I've said, they're mostly in status, uh, status um, elements. There are ways that you can extend that, but by and large, they want you to use them. And then there are, uh, there's actually four levels altogether. We then have um, preferred um, uh, example, there's one other whose name escapes me for a second, um, but they talk about how you can make that change. So for a, um, uh, actually if we, um, I won't look at that. So uh, if something is a required bind, required strength, you can't change it. 
um, if it's a preferred binding then it says please use the ones from this particular set but if you really need to add another one but if what you're trying to use matches one that's in the preferred binding then you must use that uh, and then there's the example binding which simply says we don't make any kind of um, uh, any kind of recommendation about um, about what should be in the value set here are some things to get you thinking about it and the binding strength uh, is indicated in the specification uh, alongside um, each of the uh, each of the coded elements excellent again for uh, all your presentation you're encouraged to to use fire we know uh, every year is uh, we have a new release new resources new use case so it, it's like a, an adventure of the clinician as, and developers. It is, so, although it's worth it's worth pointing out that the uh, the releases tend to be about eighteen months to two years now. They're slowing down a bit, um, and that's where the concept of maturity comes in. So we sort of think about it as being resources becoming more mature over time as they are used. But you're right; there are certainly different releases that come out that contain those. Okay. Uh, goodbye. Have a, a good day in your, <laughs> in your country and good evening for us. Okay.